Good afternoon, everyone. We have the great pleasure to welcome today Professor Aaron Strudel. He went to the University of Delaware for his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering and then to the University of Notre Dame for his PhD. He joined the University of Kansas, USA, as an associate professor in 2004 in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering. His interest focuses on sustainable chemistry and engineering, alternative solvents, phase equilibrium thermodynamics, biomass processing, cellulose, homogeneous catalysis, acid and organometallic catalysis, enzyme catalysis, and fermentation separations. Professor Scrooge has already publications between international journals and conference papers, which to date have been cited more than 2,500 times. In 2015, he became an associate editor for industrial and engineering chemical chemistry research. So once again, welcome Professor Scrooge. Thanks so much for being here and please feel free to start a presentation. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's uh, my great pleasure uh, to be giving this uh, seminar uh, with you today. And so I'm going to talk about a little bit of phase behavior and transport properties of ionic liquids with uh, compressed refrigerant gases. And you gave a little bit of bio, but I just wanted to fill in some of the connections uh, over the years. So I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Delaware, and I did a, almost three years of undergraduate research with Stan Sandler. And that's where I met uh, Marcel Castier. And I believe I met Fred there. I'm, I just don't remember that far back, uh, but I uh, definitely remember him when I did my PhD at Notre Dame with Joan Brennecke. Uh, she had a meeting with Marcelo and uh, they decided to dream up an experiment where they were going to send me down to Brazil uh, for uh, five months in order to do uh, research. And so you can see at the bottom, I spent some time in uh, 1999 for about five months uh, down at the Escola de Química. You can see uh, a much younger me in the uh, computer lab there. I was doing some type of Fortran programming. And this was Marcelo in his office there. And then definitely met Sorry, Fred. Professor. The other exactly. Yes. I don't think we see your screen, uh, Aaron. Yeah. No, yeah. Can you hear it anymore? We, we stopped your share for the introduction. Oh, OK. I, My apologies. Let me go back. Now we, now we see it. Yeah. Okay, great, great. No, wow. thanks for letting me know. I'm glad I didn't go on further. Who's that? Who's that young guy? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, looking in front of a computer and doing some Fortran programming, and uh, um, I, I had a wonderful time in Brazil. And and uh, you know, I would definitely say in some some part, it's the reason one of the reasons why I'm talking before you, at least in this uh, seminar. Um, so I've been at the University of Kansas since uh, 2004. And I just started uh, in 2014 as an associate editor for INECR. Again, if you have any great pet papers in all fields, thermodynamics or not, uh, please uh, send them to us. Uh, so with that, I'd like to get into just a brief outline we'd like to talk about today. Just introducing ionic liquids, which most people know about, and refrigerant gases. Then looking at some of the global phase behavior and, and phase equilibrium with ionic liquids and uh, refrigerant gases. And then I'd like to kind of break down and show some applications of some of the modeling and making up some new ideas of using ionic liquids and refrigerant gases. Then show the real need for transport properties in this field and go over liquid viscosity, diffusivity, and thermal conductivity. So I probably don't need to give this slide, but obviously ionic liquids are organic salts that are liquid near room temperature you know, a liquid over a very wide range of conditions. And because they have such low vapor pressure, uh, sometimes it's immeasurable vapor pressure, they've been touted as potential green solvents because it at least eliminates one of the largest form of solvent pollution, that being air pollution or, you know, evaporation. And so obviously this uh, helps workers and also helps uh, some aspects of sustainability. And at the bottom, you see the, the, the classic categories and classes of cations. Uh, from imidazolium to uh, perlidinium, to phosphonium, et cetera, and a wide variety of different uh, anions. So because of these different R groups and different, you know, it's been touted that there's been a 10 to 14th pop possible ionic liquid. So that's a lot of ionic liquids to study, even if it's only 10 to the eighth, that's still a lot of ionic liquids to study. Um, so I think that people in this field really have jobs for a very long time 
uh, or until we have the molecular modelers figure everything out where we just need a structure and we get all the properties within experimental ac accuracy. That'll be a great day. So in the literature and in, in my group, we've already shown uh, all sorts of different application of ionic liquids. Within my groups, we do some things in homogeneous catalysis on, in ionic liquids, uh, obviously separations, uh, looking at materials processing. Uh, we've done a good amount of work looking at uh, using ionic liquids for cellulose and biomass processing. And as what I'll show some of the applications uh, in engineering and power uh, type production for ionic liquids. So because ionic liquids have very, very low vapor pressures, so for instance, I'll be showing the hexyl methyl imidazolium bis-trifluorosulfanilamide ionic liquid. Uh, a lot is the model ionic liquid. You know, it has a measurable vapor pressure, but if you extrapolate it to room temperature, we're talking about vapor pressures on the order of a nanopascal. Um, so for all intents and purposes, they are non-volatile. And so we've seen this with a lot of different, especially permanent gases, that the ionic liquid is just immeasurably insoluble in the vapor phase, even up to very high pressures. However, uh, it has been shown uh, that if you put uh, some polar co-solvents in some of these gases, such as supercritical CO2, you can start to get some ionic liquids to uh, dissolve in the uh, fluid phase, the vapor phase. And uh, Core Peters also showed that with uh, hydrofluorocarbons like fluoroform, they actually have dew points. So obviously they have some finite solubility. But for most gases, it's going to be low to no. And for some, we'll have to worry about uh, their solubility in that uh, other phase, that polar gas phase. So some of the goals I'd like to talk about in this seminar are looking at the measurement, modeling, and development of applications of using ionic liquids and compressed refrigerant gases, and namely show uh, phase equilibrium thermodynamics and transport properties. So just uh, some of the ionic liquids that I'll focus on. Again, these are mostly just model uh, ionic liquids. There's obviously a huge variety, uh, but looking at the imidazolium-based uh, ionic liquids and per uh, methyl pyridol pyridolinium ionic liquids. And I'll be doing a lot of different things looking at this model ionic li liquid, which we abbreviate HMIM TF2M. I've kind of focused in on just two gases for uh, this seminar, one being CO2 as a uh, nonpolar gas, and then one this tetrafluoroethane, which is uh, a refrigerant gas with the uh, ASHRAE moniker of R134A. And so I'll be using these to kind of compare and contrast behavior and applications, et cetera. So just a, a, a little bit on some of the experimental methodology. Uh, we have developed a high pressure vapor liquid equilibrium cell. It's based upon a kind of mass balance where we know precisely how much uh, moles mass of the gas we inject to our system side. And then by difference of knowing how much of that gas still remains in the lines and the headspace, uh, we can determine how much of that gas must be uh, in the uh, liquid phase, in this case, the ionic liquid phase. And so we can simultaneously also get some approximations for uh, density and that thus we're able to compute things like molarity, uh, et cetera. We're also able to get uh, critical points, both visually observe them, but also get the compositions at the critical point. And this particular cell can go up to 300 bar or so. We also do a little bit of modeling, uh, mostly uh, type of phase behavior using equations of state and uh, mixing rules and using uh, obviously the ionic liquids all decompose before their critical points. And so we use some of the uh, predicted uh, TCPC omega, say foam, Valderrama's papers, uh, et cetera, and other types of group contribution methods. So I'd like to show this kind of background, uh, you know, especially for the students, uh, looking at the, the six basic types of phase behavior as by Scott and Van Koninenberg, we know that there's probably more of these. And uh, some time ago, uh, UPAC tried to kind of formalize this with a new nomenclature system that you'll see in the parentheses. Uh, but the use of these classification schemes uh, from Scott and Van Koninenberg uh, still linger. 
and really they just show the various features, the salient features of all these different types of diagrams, especially how they're critical points, whether they're continuous or not, uh, and different types of regions of multi-phase equilibria like vapor liquid liquid equilibria, and then critical endpoints, whether the, the liquids become critical or a vapor in one of the liquids become critical uh, throughout this. And so we'll be focusing in on type three type systems and type five type systems. So five, five systems, we have these critical endpoints and this continuous curve, which connects the lower critical endpoint and the critical point. Now, uh, I also bring this up for students because I know exactly where I was when I started learning this. And that was when I spent time in Brazil. I had about a 40 minute uh, bus ride uh, to and from the university. And so there's usually three things that I was doing on that bus going to and from uh, the university. One was just gazing at the beauty of the city. Two, I was reading something uh, to try to learn Portuguese. And three, I was learning thermodynamics. And so I know almost the exact bus where I started learning this uh, Scott and Van Konenberg uh, classification scheme. And I'd go through it and learn all the salient features and try to figure out what the third dimension in composition would look like. Uh, and it served me well for the rest of my career. So looking at some of the ionic liquid and CO2 uh, behavior. So again, we've probed uh, the kind of general phase behavior of uh, ionic liquids, a variety of ionic liquids. I just show here this HMMTF2N as a um, standard model ionic liquids. And we believe this to be a type three system. We could find uh, really no regions where we had any type of critical points or critical endpoints. We really get this three phase vapor liquid liquid equilibrium system. And you'll notice that it's really on top of the vapor pressure of CO2. And to tell the truth within our experimental accuracy, we really can't distinguish uh, the a pressure difference between the vapor pressure uh, line and the three phase vapor liquid liquid equilibrium line. And also the upper critical end point, we really can't distinguish from the critical point of CO2. So we believe this to be a type three phase behavior. Now taking a, a few slices of this and looking at the phase equilibrium, uh, we can see this kind of uh, classic form that's been found with ionic liquids where we get a pretty large solubility, somewhat linear, almost like a Henry's law regime at the beginning. But then at some intermediate pressures, we start to get this, what we call a chimney effect where our marginal increase in solubility with pressure goes down significantly. So large increases in pressure here does not change the solubility very much. We also can measure within our, our accuracy any uh, ionic liquid in the vapor phase. So it's gotta be below say 10 to the minus five or so uh, mole fraction. But now looking at 25 degrees, we also notice that we hit this vapor liquid liquid equilibrium point and this region of liquid liquid equilibria that seems to go on for a very long time. Uh, we can't find the top if it ever goes to a mixture critical points. And again, this VLLE occurs almost exactly at the same pre vapor pressure of CO2. And you also see some of the modeling, and this is just using the van der Waal uh, two parameter mixing rules with the Peng Robinson equation of state. And it does a very good job over the large range of temperatures and pressures. And even the KIGs and LIGs are still reasonable compared to other uh, organics. The interesting thing is with uh, Peng Robinson, we also see that we're able to predict something of a dew point here, but we believe that this is probably several orders of magnitude off uh, than reality. But at least as far as the bubble point curves, that does a, a fairly good job um, with reasonable in interaction parameters. Again, this is what we believe uh, is, is a type three system. And even though this portion has vapor liquid liquid equilibrium, that liquid rich CO2 phase and the vapor phase is has a measurably small amounts of ionic liquid in them. And so normally on a organic, there'd be a small uh, VLE region over here, but we just cannot find it uh, whatsoever. So interesting type three behavior with CO2 and these ionic liquids. More recently, uh, you'll see some of these uh, references are from you know, uh, 2008, 2009, uh, but we've uh, kept up some of this work and recently have looked at CO2 and methyl pyrrolidinium uh, type ionic liquids, looking at keeping the TF2N anion constant 
and looking at C3, C4, and C6 alkyl groups off of the pyrrolidinium uh, cation. And we see very similar behavior uh, with the imidazolium class of ionic liquids, as you can see here at 70, 50, and 25 degrees. And here's plotted a, a, a zoom looking at uh, the C4 pyrrolidinium, C6 pyrrolidinium, and HMIM TF2N, which I showed on the previous slide. Very, very similar solubilities, very, very similar uh, phase behavior. So it appears that the anion has a very large effect both on the phase behavior, but also the quantitative uh, phase equilibrium that you get for these particular systems. So now we'd like to transition to another gas, that being of uh, 1112 tetrafluoroethane, which I'll abbreviate almost on all these slides as R134A. And so this particular gas is a much more polar gas. And we can see what, what this idea of polarity does to both the phase behavior and the phase equilibrium. So here's R134A with this model ionic liquid, HMIM TF2N. And you can see here, at least the phase behavior on the PT projection, that now instead of uh, CO2, where we do not have re regions of uh, miscibility, uh, here with uh, R134A and HMIM, we have regions that go from miscible to also these lower critical endpoints, upper critical endpoints, regions of liquid-liquid equilibria that terminate in liquid-liquid mix mixture critical points. And then, of, of course, these also continue on to go into vapor liquid uh, mixture critical points. And so we, we, we believe this to be a type five system. Again, we can't find any other upper critical endpoints uh, in this. We've only gone down to zero degrees Celsius, uh, but at least for now, it looks like uh, that uh, this is a type five system. We've recently acquired some environmental chambers that can go to minus 40 degrees Celsius. And so we're gonna try to look and, and double check to make sure that this system is indeed a type five system, at least until minus 40 degrees Celsius. So again, now we have aspects where there is some ionic liquid in some of these other phases. We have a mixture critical point, say here at 75 degrees, that's around 5% of the ionic liquid. And this goes along with other uh, hydrofluorocarbons, namely fluoroform that Corpeter showed actually had dew points and critical points uh, with this particular uh, ionic liquid, BMIM PF6. So again, much more interesting and diverse uh, phase behavior going from CO2 to a mo more polar R134A gas. And just to show some pictures of what some of these transitions look like, uh, we load up our view cell and you'll see a little stir bar in the center there. We start pressurizing up with R134A where we get vapor liquid equilibrium and you can see we do get a decent amount of swelling uh, of the ionic liquid. Um, for CO2, CO2 swells ionic liquids very little, maybe at most 10%. But here it can be uh, several hundred percent, um, just like normal uh, gases with organic solvents. We raise the pressure and temperature and we hit uh, this lower critical uh, endpoint where you can kind of just see the just the form beginning of the formation of two liquid phases and equilibrium with the vapor phase. After the LCP, we get vapor li liquid liquid equilibrium up until the upper critical endpoint. And then you can see that as we raise the temperature and pressure even further, we now have a homogeneous uh, critical uh, phase uh, for this particular mixture. Now, just to take a slice in that uh, PT uh, phase diagram here at 75 degrees uh, Celsius, um, you can see here is the vapor liquid equilibria, but then we hit a vapor liquid liquid equilibria, a region of liquid liquid equilibria and a mixture critical point. This, this is modeling using Peng Robinson equation of state and really just the Van der Waals one parameter mixing rule. And again, some very good quantitative fits with a reasonable K12 and uh, a pretty good uh, prediction. So in this, we only fit this to the VLE data, but it predicted the VLE pretty well, LLE pretty well, and this liquid liquid, and even got pretty close, I'd say within four or five bar of the actual mixture critical point. Now it seems to overestimate the, the amount of ionic liquid in the R134A rich phase and the, the vapor phase, but at least for the bubble points in this liquid liquid and mixture critical point, even just a simple uh, Peng Robinson equation to state Van der Waals one parameter mixing rule uh, does a pretty good job at correlating the data. 
we want to understand the effect of different ionic liquids or different anions uh, on this uh, kind of global phase behavior. So we went and looked at some of the standard ones from you know years ago. Again, BF4 and PF6 are kind of discouraged nowadays as far as both research and use uh, because they have known hyd hydrolysis and decomposition effects, uh, often forming HF, et, et cetera. But in these particular studies, we were measuring water contents and uh, any type of decomposition uh, products uh, before and after our results. So we're fairly certain that any of these decomposition products don't affect these uh, results. So if you look at the effect of BF4, PF6, and TF2N, you can see that things become really more miscible as you go up from BF4, PF6 to TF2N. If you notice the size goes up, which means the charge density is going down for this as well. And so it seems that the uh, R134A, this uh, polar vapor, especially in a liquid phase, is better able to become miscible to solvate uh, this particular ionic, uh, ionic liquid better uh, as we go from BF4 to this uh, TF2N molecule. And again, the critical points increase in the opposite direction if we're going from a standard uh, temperature and looking at different pressures. What's interesting is when we change the anion and go from HMM TF2N or any other ones on the other page, uh, to bromide. Bromide's interesting with R134A in that it doesn't form these regions uh, or form critical points that we can find at least up to 400 uh, bar. So we believe this might be actually a type three system. So we can see that as you, sh as you shrink the size, you know, increase the charge density on the anion, that the ability for R134A to solvate or to become miscible uh, with the ionic liquid decreases. And so here we always, we can't find any miscible or critical regions. We find these VLLE points basically at the same exact vapor pressure as R134A. So interesting, the effect of anions can have on the global phase behavior and of course the phase equilibrium solubilities. Uh, HMM bromide has some of the lowest solubilities of the uh, refrigerant gas or even with CO2 as well. So just to kind of summarize this section, uh, CO2 seems to form type three systems. There's gonna be always two phases form. TF2N uh, seems to be uh, one of the, has the highest CO2 solubility. And if we increase the alkyl chain length, we increase the solubility, most likely due to an increase in our free volume of our system. R134A with these ionic liquids is a little bit more interesting in that we get type five phase behavior. So we have regions of, liquid liquid equilibrium and uh, miscibility and criticality. And it seems that the anion has a very large effect to play both on the global phase behavior, but also on the phase equilibrium as well. The alkyl group does have some, some small change, uh, but it's not as uh, dramatic as the effect of anions. And some of this as, as, as alluded to, you know, probably has to do some things with polarity. And polarity can mean a whole bunch of different things. So for instance, we like using Camlet-Taff polarity parameters because they kind of divide up at least into three different types of polarity or three kind of lumped types of polarity, uh, how, how to look at different molecules and systems. Dipole moment, another one. And here we're showing a dielectric constants. You know, it's use in electrolyte solutions to understand solvation of electrolytes. We can see here with CO2, it has a very, very low uh, dielectric constant, whereas our R134A does have a much, much higher dielectric constant. Here's uh, some typical ranges for the dielectric constant of the ionic liquid. So we believe understanding these ideas of polarity will help better explain some of the uh, phenology that we see with these ionic liquids and compressed gas gases. So looking at the phase equilibrium thermodynamics, I wanted just to take a pause and go into what can we do with some of these systems? You know, what are some potential applications? And what I'm going to show here is really just taking the models systems such as HMMTF2N and CO2 ionic liquids, the, just the simple equation of state and mixing rules that, that, that we use in order to try to come up with some new ideas and some new applications of these uh, potential ionic liquids. 
And so I'd like to show three different applications. Uh, two of them are going to be more in the uh, power or an engineering type applications. So one looking at a new gas ionic liquid absorption power cycle, uh, looking at absorption refrigeration now using ionic liquids, and then looking at the separation of refrigerant gases themselves using ionic liquids. So power generation using a variety of different hydrofluorocarbons and other type of gases through the organic Raken cycle is currently being practiced industrially. And in this situation, you have a pump that takes a, the condensed liquid uh, refrigerant, goes to the evaporator where we use heat as opposed to a compressor to produce a high temperature, high pressure gas. That gas goes, goes to the turbine and then produces power. But then we have to limit the pressure that comes out of the uh, turbine because we need to be able to condense that gas into a liquid. And we usually need to use at least say five degrees subcool as an industry standard. We also need to add a receiver to prevent any type of gas from getting into the pump and damaging the pump or stalling out uh, the, the particular system. And this is particularly important when you're starting up and shutting down these type of organic Rankine cycles. The other thing is that a lot of these cycles require a decent quality heat, usually in excess of 100 degrees uh, Celsius. So is there something we can do that can lower the temperature of this required heat and maybe potentially get around this fact that we need these subcools and receivers, et cetera, uh, for these type of power cycles. And so one thing that we've uh, proposed and actually recently uh, published, this was a, a collaboration with uh, Francisco Hong and Steve Lustig at Northeastern Uni uh, University. Uh, Steve, especially for looking at these things to try to model these from uh, Cosmo uh, SAC and Francisco for Cosmo and also for process flow modeling, et cetera. So here we propose uh, somewhat similar to the absor absorption refrigeration that I'll show, is here we take the gas that comes after the, comp the turbine, first dissolve it in an ionic liquid, and then that is pumped to what we call the desorber where we're adding, adding our heat. And again, because we always have a liquid here, we never have to worry about safety things about trying to keep gas from ever getting into our, our pump. And because of that, we can increase or lower the pressure that comes out of our turbine, thus being able to get more work for a given unit mole of our uh, refrigerant gas in this particular case. And so again, because the ionic liquid in this desorber is non-volatile, we don't have to worry about the ionic liquid coming out of here and getting into our turbine, which would also cause uh, problems. And so we were able to simulate the traditional organic Rankine cycle and this new, newly proposed cycle, looking at different evaporator temperatures. So what's the temperature of the heat that you put into your system and what are going to be the condensers or the absorber uh, temperature that you're using to cool that gas as it dissolves back into the ionic liquid. And what we see is a variety of different conditions that in this particular case with 100 degrees Celsius in the desorber, 40 in the absorber, our new process is about 9% more, uh, more efficient than the traditional organic Rankine cycle. And this is using HMMTF2N and R134A as a model type of uh, refrigerant gas, working fluid, and solvent. We look at a variety of other different conditions, and it seems that the lower the quality heat and even the higher the uh, cooling capability is, so how much less cooling capability you have, this system seems to work even better. So we're encouraged that we might be able to put a system like this into place using very low quality heat that might, might be actually currently being just released into the atmosphere because it doesn't seem to be able to fit with our traditional ORC, organic Rankine cycle, but we might be able to use this for this ionic liquid. And again, this is just using a model ionic liquid system. This is what we had on hand, what we had modeled. Again, with 10 to the, let's say, eight different ionic liquids, uh, you know, the probability that this ionic liquid is completely optimized and the best for this particular cycle is pr pretty much one in a million. So we're pretty encouraged that there's probably other ionic liquids and gas combinations that will produce even a better job over the uh, current organic Rankine cycle. 
So another application uh, that's very similar to this is the traditional uh, absor absorption refrigeration. So your traditional refrigeration cycle, the vapor compression cycle has a compressor, you need to condense that to a liquid, it goes across an expansion valve into the evaporator, whereby we get our cooling effect. Absorption refrigeration replaces the, uh, replaces the compressor and replaces it with something very similar to the power cycle where first we absorb the working fluid gas, refrigerant gas in a liquid that's then pumped to the generator where we add heat to liberate a high pressure, high temperature gas. And then it goes into the same condenser and evaporator that you'd find on a normal a refrigeration system. However, because most solvents, and so for instance, uh, ammonia as a working fluid and water as a solvent is one of the, one of the most common absorption refrigeration uh, systems, often a what's called a rectifier, just like a rectifier rectification section of a distillation column is needed because to you need to take out the water. And, then, and that's extremely important. So for instance, with the ammonia water absorption system, just a hundred parts per million of water that get through to the condenser and through the evaporator decrease the COP, the efficiency by 5%. So just a hundred PPM. So they usually have to add these other sections which adds to the bulk and adds to the expense of using these type of absorption refrigeration uh, systems. So what we were wondering, can an ionic liquid solvent where we don't have to worry about the volatility uh, be able to overcome this need for a rectifier? And can we possibly shrink this footprint to be able to use, use this in vehicle air conditioning systems? We were working with a, a local uh, Department of Transportation uh, research center looking at this uh, potential possibility of, can we make this into cars? Why? Because for every air conditioner that's in a vehicle, an extra barrel of gasoline, not just a barrel of oil, extra barrel of gasoline is used just to run your vehicle's air conditioning system. So is there any way that we can use this absorption system and use some type of heat that are found in vehicles in order to power this, this type of cycle? So what we've done here is, uh, simulated the traditional vapor compression cycle that you, you have in your traditional automobile, uh, looking at different RPMs, et cetera, but really seeing what kind of cooling effects we can get. We then looked at our new ionic liquid R134A absorption system. And uh, what you can see is that our cooling effect, we can get even better cooling effects than a traditional system. And you can see from looking at, here's the work of the compressor, and the work of the pump, we can see that the work of the pump for the recirculation in our absorption system is orders of magnitude less than that of the compressor. But in our system, we do need heat. And so right here, we need that heat to power this cycle. Where can we potentially get it? Well, if you look at a particular car burning uh, gasoline, we have about 70 kilowatts of chemical power uh, from the combustion of gasoline. And in that very small fraction of that actually goes to the drivetrain to actually turn the automobile. Most of that energy goes into either the exhaust heat, uh, 28 kilowatts, or into the coolant in the vehicle, 21 kilowatts. So if you notice what we'd need to power this particular air conditioner is less than the heat uh, available in either the coolant or the exhaust. So potentially there might be a way to use a vehicle's either exhaust or in their coolant system with a heat exchanger in order to power uh, this type of system. The other thing is with R134A, remember there are regions where it becomes miscible and critical. And so in designing these type of systems, we need to have that understanding of the global phase behavior to make sure that we aren't trying to design these refrigeration systems or power cycles in regions that get close to some of these three phase or crit critical points, et cetera in order to properly design the systems. We've also looked at these, uh, this application for CO2 and we see similar results, how it does improve things over a vapor compression uh, system. However, with CO2, obviously we're talking about higher uh, system pressures than with R134A. Now, it, it seems like it might be possible theoretically to put this in the car, but we, we think that it's a better probability to possibly put these in trucks or buses or trains, something with you know, a larger space uh, available and potentially uh, more compact uh, places where we can actually get the heat to run these particular things. 
And again, this was just looking at R134 and HMIM TF2N because we had the VLE data and the modeling already done. So it was easy or easier to, uh, to simulate these potential power cycles or absorption refrigeration systems. So again, we give it about a one in a million chance that this HMIM TF2N and R134A is the best match possible for these type of applications. I'd like to go on to the, the, the next application that looking at refrigerant gases. So again, in the beginning, there were chlorofluorocarbons, great refrigerants, very low toxicity to humans. But obviously we found out that they were doing a incredible amount of damage to the ozone later and had a high ozone depleting potential. We then evolved to H uh, HCFCs, which had a little bit lower uh, ozone depletion potential, but it was still, uh, still finite and thus, the Montreal Protocol uh, came into effect, which had us transition from HCFCs and CFCs to hydrofluorocarbons. Now, hydrofluorocarbons have zero ozone depletion potential, but they do have a large global warming potential and just the tons and tons of use uh, that are always leaked into the atmosphere now has concerns for climate change and global warming. And so because of some of these HFCs have high global warming condition, the Kigali amend amendment uh, just began to come into effect where all the assignees over a 30 year period are going to phase out the HCFCs with the highest uh, global warming potentials. And so people have seen, especially companies like Camoras, which we're working with, uh, are now producing what are called hydrofluoroolefins, uh, which have, uh, zero ozone depletion potential and have a glo low global warming potential, not because they have a much lower heat of vaporization, heat capacity, because they have much shorter lifetimes in the atmosphere because they have that double bond. And there's been a renewed interest in looking at other type of inorganic uh, refrigerants such as CO2 or isobutane, uh, ammonia, uh, et cetera. So we're looking at this particular problem of the need to phase out some of these HFCs with high global warming potential. So for instance, there's a lot of uh, common mixtures of these HFCs and on the pure components, it's much easier to know that, well, one of these HFC, this HFC in particular needs to be phased out. We need to replace it at some point in time. But we have these very commonly used mixtures. So for instance, 410A, widely used, uh, especially in uh, grocery stores and convenience stores, uh, HVAC equipment, et cetera. And that's a mixture of difluoromethane, R32, and pentafluoroethane, R125. Now, when looking at the global warming potentials of these two in the this azeotropic mixture, R32 is relatively low, so it's not being sl slated to in most countries being slated to being phased out uh, anytime soon, but R125 is slated to be uh, phased out. However, it's found in this azeotropic mixture, you know, when we try to replace this uh, and try to reuse that material, because th these are made on, you know, thousands of tons scale, you know, how do we try to potentially recover and recycle these particular ionic liquid or particular refrigerant gases um, R407C is a mixture of this R32, R125, and this tetrafluoroethane that I've been showing a lot of our preliminary work on. Again, this is in a tight mixture too, but R125 needs to be phased out. But what about these other components in the mixture? These are difficult se separations. And again, if there's no good solutions, what's currently being practiced right now is just incineration, which obviously is not the probably best use of this material. We'd love to be able to get these uh, HFCs that can be recycled and can be reused in different other type of refrigeration applications. And so uh, we've recently been a recipient of a National Science Foundation uh, grant, which we're entitling the Environmentally Applied Research Towards Hydrocarbons uh, Project. Uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Mark Shiflet is heading this. Uh, Mark's interesting, he worked uh, with the, the DuPont company uh, for about 28 years in their research development and actually helped develop some of these uh, refrigerant and refrigerant mixtures that are being used on the multi-ton scale worldwide. Uh, luckily, a few years ago, we were able to uh, convince him to come, back, come to academia as a distinguished professor here at the University of Kansas. And you can see he's already put together a great, great center with some great, great people. As you can see, uh, Ed McGinn, who's already given 
your inaugural uh, Adams address, uh, Ed Castor, who does spectroscopy, Emily Penser, who looks at materials chemistry, and Farouk Hassan, who does process uh, systems uh, type engineering. And, and this particular project is looking at using ionic liquids, uh, membranes, and zeolites in order to produce some of these separations in order to figure out how, what do we do with some of these gas mixtures that might have to go to the incinerator if we can't figure out a good way to separate them and recycle them. And so we're looking at things from a multi-scale type approach. Uh, again, looking at ionic liquids, membranes, and absorption, even including supported ionic liquid membranes and supported ionic liquid phase materials or even polyionic liquids, et cetera. And we're gonna be looking at things through through experiments, obviously molecular modeling, spectroscopy, material synthesis, process modeling, and uh, we have slated to build a pilot scale demonstration unit of an ionic liquid used to separate uh, some of these uh, refrigerant gases at elevated pressures. And so we're very excited. We really just started this project uh, this fall, but we're uh, hopeful to be able to come up with some of these separations and especially a better understanding of ionic liquids themselves, of refrigerant gases themselves, and especially that combination of ionic liquids and refrigerants. So I've showed several different potential applications of ionic liquids and refrigerant gases. Uh, so they look, at least from a thermodynamic perspective, thermodynamic modeling uh, to be very uh, promising. But I wanted to take a kind of more global look at things. And if you look at the literature right now, obviously there's tens of thousands of publications and patents dealing with ionic, ionic liquids. Uh, my colleague, Mark Shiflett, actually just uh, edited a book uh, that just came out uh, recently on the commercial applications of ionic liquids. He and other industrial leaders uh, with ionic liquids came together and they really estimated that there's probably about 50 industrial applications of ionic liquids and maybe about 50 that are currently being used as industrial trade secrets. So they're not being published that they're being used. But you know, there seems to be a disjoint between tens of thousands of publications and you know, really you know, maybe 10 to the second uh, type of applications that are being used industrially. You know, how do we start bridging this gap? You know, what's, what are some of the problems? Well, one of the problems is not having enough transport property data so that scale up can be, at least design and scale up can be implemented uh, to make these a uh, reality. And this could be indirectly or uh, directly with the ionic liquids. So for instance, sometimes it's quoted that ionic liquids, some ionic liquids are too expensive for a lot of applications. But in a lot of ways, it's the process scale up, which hasn't been done, that always reduces cost. And that's one of the, some of the reasons why certain ionic liquids look relatively expensive right now. So again, we saw that you know, over the years that transport properties seem to be a needed key, a missing dimension uh, in the literature compared to the tens of thousands of papers in the chemistry the applications and even in the thermodynamics of ionic liquids uh, type systems. So just to go over quickly some of the experiments, uh, experimental techniques that we use uh, for getting the transport properties of ionic liquids and compressed gases under these more elevated conditions. So, uh, we have this high pressure uh, viscometer. It's a Cambridge PAC model and it operates on the principle of an oscillating piston where there's a, a, a magnetic field that controls a, a mag magnetic but uh, corrosion resistant uh, piston that uh, moves back and forth in the fluid. So basically you have a flow in an annulus and from the time it takes for cycles compared to the power input of the electric coils you can determine the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. And this particular unit can go up to 1400 bar of pressure and 200 degrees Celsius. We've recently added a high pressure Anton Parr densitometer uh, that can go also to 1400 bar and about 200 degrees Celsius. So here we have our equilibrium view cell uh, where the liquid is uh, pumped out through the densitometer, through the viscometer and then comes back to the top of our cell, either as a spray or, or wets the wall of the upper portion of the cell, providing mixing and getting a mass transfer in, in order to get equilibrium. And so we can get pretty high quality uh, uh, viscosity and now 
uh, density data with our particular system. And we have an environmental change that can go to minus 40 to 190 degrees Celsius. For diffusivities, we actually been mostly using an NMR type technique. Now, my colleague, uh, Mark Schifflet does a lot with gravimetric microbalances. And from his measurements, uh, he can actually get the Fickian uh, diffusivities of gases dissolved. And, but here we're getting the self-diffusion uh, coefficients through this pulse gradient spin echo uh, NMR, proton NMR technique. And it is a proton NMR technique. We can potentially use some fluorine ones in the future. We haven't uh, gotten to that point. But what we can do is we can track the diffusion of the, at least the cation and uh, in some of the cases, our tetrafluoroethane. Obviously with CO2, we don't have any protons, so we can't track CO2, but we can track uh, the cation. Uh, we've been using these medium pressure uh, NMR tubes, which can go to 13 bar. We've also developed more recently uh, capabilities to go over 100 bar uh, with NMR, uh, but we're still working out that for the self-diffusivity uh, measurements. And this technique uh, basically provides a certain pulse sequence. And then what we do is we track the spectra, the proton NMR spectra of one of the particular protons. And uh, from uh, understanding how that decays uh, over time, we're able to back out the diffusion coefficients of whatever of that peak. So either the diffusion coefficient of one of the protons in the cation or in R134A. So to get heat transfer properties, we use a, a Flucon device. It's a transient hot wire technique. And so uh, if you can kind of see down here, we have a very thin platinum wire uh, that uh, provides heat and then an RTD, which records the temperature over time. And through the transport equations or the heat transport equations uh, around a cylinder, uh, we're able to get the thermal conductivities of the given fluid. And we can put these into the, our high pressure cells in order to get uh, under these compressed conditions. So here's some results of looking at the liquid viscosity of our model ionic liquid, HMMTF2N, with both CO2 and R134A. Uh, we measure these according to pressure at first. And then using our vapor liquid equilibrium that we measure with other techniques, uh, we're able to at least calculate or predict what the composition is at the given temperature and pressure uh, that our, our system is, is at. Okay, so uh, normally the raw data is in terms of viscosity versus pressure, but we're able to translate to that to viscosity versus composition. And you can see in both cases that uh, with even just moderate amounts of either CO2 or R134A, we're able to drop the viscosity of the ionic liquids significantly. And so the viscosity of ionic liquids has been a point raised in a lot of different applications that, well, some ionic liquids are really too viscous for certain applications. Uh, maybe, you know, it's just going to be uh, need too much process intensification in order to get them to work. But what we see with this, any type of compressed gases, it really doesn't take that much compressed gas dissolved into the ionic liquid to significantly reduce the uh, viscosity of these ionic liquids to a much more manageable uh, viscosity levels at a variety of different temperatures and pressures. So uh, again, this is not a pressure effect, it is a composition effect. And so if we graph viscosity versus pressure on this axis in the blue using the left axis. And then the uh, vapor from the vapor liquid equilibrium looking at the pressure composition effect, and this is at 25 degrees Celsius, we can basically see that that drop in composition is basically a mirror image to the increase in the composition of, in this case, CO2, but this is also looks qualitatively similar uh, for R134A or a variety of other, other gases. So again, when it comes to how does that gas affect the ionic liquids, at least momentum transfer, its viscosity, uh, it's really more of a, a diluent type effect. We have this low viscosity uh, fluid um, being dissolved into our more viscous ionic liquid. We've also recently uh, looked at this uh, in terms of other ionic liquid types, or so pyrrolidinium ionic liquid types, looking at C3, C4, C6 methyl uh, type systems. And again, we see a large decrease in the um, 
in the viscosity with pressure. And again, it's according to uh, the composition. And so very similar effects between uh, HMIM or any of the alkyl methylimidazolium types, uh, TF2N and CO2, or these pyrrolidinium types. And this was in collaboration with Donna Bake and Bob Fox at the Idaho National Lab. They were most interested in looking at this as an application of doing electrochemistry in biphasic CO2 ionic liquid systems. And what they were very excited about was that it seemed like the viscosity at the conditions of interest uh, for their electrochemistry results or SIP applications uh, were much, much lower than what it would be looking at the pure ionic liquid. And they're also enthusiastic that even though they might be able to find or develop an ionic liquid that had superior uh, electrochemical properties, but if it was at a high uh, viscosity to ambient pressures, which would be a negative, they realized that at their application conditions, it probably won't be uh, a big problem at all. So interesting with findings with other type of ionic liquids for other applications. So we've also measured the uh, diffusivities of HMMTF2N saturated uh, with R134A. Again, we uh, measure these with pressure, but then use our vapor liquid equilibrium results to translate this to composition. And you can see that the diffusivity does increase uh, with higher um, amounts of our R134A. And again, what you see as far as lines are the Stokes-Einstein uh, Stokes type equation, where we take the ambient condition viscosity and diffusivity. And then our mixture viscosity results that I showed on a few slides above, we're able to use that as a prediction for the diffusivity pretty well uh, with the experimental data. And we're excited about this in that uh, the diffusivity data takes a long time to acquire. Uh, we're talking hours and hours and days and days and days of NMR results uh, for, for different points. Whereas the viscosity data, we can take an isotherm in about a day or so. And so this looks like that we might just need to, the ambient pressure diffusivities and then at least some mixture viscosity data to have pretty good predictions of what the diffusivity here, according to the cation, uh, would be in the ionic liquid at other conditions, elevated pressures and elevated uh, compositions. So uh, with the previous system, which was at vapor liquid equilibrium, we wanted to see what it would look like as we made measurements across the whole composition uh, range. And so what we did was we took liquid R134A, which at least uh, below um, uh, 60 degrees Celsius uh, doesn't, is below its lower critical endpoint, which means it becomes miscible at, at the vapor pressure of R134A. So at 25 degrees, we're able to get solutions of the ionic liquid in R134A across the whole pressure, uh, whole composition range. And you can see that we're able to get both the diffusivity of the R134A and the diffusivity of the cation. Now, I should say that when we report diffusivities of the cation, we really don't know what the state of agglomeration of that ionic liquid is. So for instance, is it a completely solvent separated cation. In that particular case, when we track the diffusivity, we'd be tracking the diffusivity of a solvent, sol uh, solvent solvated cation. However, if it does form a solvent contact or contact pair or et cetera, now we're really looking at, we can't differentiate between those different uh, diffusivities. And so what the diffusivity we, we'd be reading from the NMR technique would be some type of average uh, between any type of, say, cation anion combinations or agglomerates or a fully solvent, completely independent cation. So again, we can't differentiate that. So what you see for diffusivities is going to be kind of that average. But again, across the, across the range that if you increase the amount of the ionic liquid, we can increase by over an order of magnitude the diffusivity of the cation. We add more ionic liquid to the uh, refrigerant, and obviously we're decreasing the diffusivity of the cation. Uh, but you can see that uh, you know, we, 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 we can measure what these diffusivities of the self-diffusion coefficients of both the refrigerant gas dissolved and, or the liquid uh, refrigerant and the ionic liquid itself. Again, this is probably not, most, not a, a large part due to any specific ionic liquid um, R134A interactions, but probably more of that kind of diluent effect that the mixture viscosity 
is more correlated to these results than any particular uh, ionic liquid uh, R134A interactions. So the last transport property. So we did uh, momentum transfer, mass transfer properties and diffusivities. And now we're looking at heat transfer properties. So here is the pure component uh, thermal conductivity of here of HMMTF2N, this monolonic liquid I've been using throughout the talk. And we can see that uh, we match up pretty well with uh, others uh, in the literature. And so now what we do is we add uh, R134A to see what's the behavior that we get. Again, we get naturally, we get um, at a given temperature, we get the thermal conductivity uh, versus pressure, but from the vapor liquid equilibrium data, we're able to translate that into composition data. So you can see, interesting that this transport property is it's relatively flat. It does have a slight linear decrease uh, with composition of the R134A, but not, not a dramatic decrease like what we saw for uh, viscosity or the large increase that we saw with diffusivity. This seems to be just a relatively minor uh, decrease, except when we get to this very high con concentrations or compositions of the R134A. We don't have data in here yet. Uh, we only had vapor liquid equilibrium data to here, uh, but we hope to see if there's any, uh, how does this connect? So here are the pure saturated thermal conductivities of the uh, R134A at 25, 50, and 75. So somehow these connect, um, but anyways, it's pretty linear at first, but then it has a very large drop uh, with the very high compositions of the R134A. So normally when one thinks about how does the thermal conductivity change in mixtures, looking at the two pure components, often ideas such as density come up and that's, you know, most of the mechanisms of heat transfer in liquids have to do with the collisions of molecules, et cetera. Again, this is not a, a kinetic type uh, effect that you see for uh, gas thermal conductivity. Uh, but we see this type of behavior here and if we try to try to put a simple linear uh, fit to this, notice that we would vastly or, or large part under predict the thermal conductivity of the particular mixture. And again, most of the time when, when engineers try to do any type of thermal engineering and they don't have mixture heat transfer coefficients, often you know, using a very simple molar mass fraction average of the two pure component properties, well, look with this particular system. If we were to be out here, say, at 70% of the R134A, our, our kind of simple mixing rule prediction would be about 25% under that. Now, how does that propagate out in thermal engineering? Well, remember, most of the time you're looking at heat transfer numbers, whether you're trying to design uh, reboilers and extractive distillation column or different types of heat exchangers, et cetera. You're mostly interested in this heat, heat transfer coefficient, which is mo mostly found in Nusselt numbers as a function of your Reynolds number and your Prandtl number. But notice where our thermal conductivity resides in the denominator of the Nusselt number and the denominator of the Prandtl number. So again, this 25% error uh, from our simple mixing rules in thermal conductivities is obviously going to make a much higher percentage error in both the Prandtl number and the Nusselt number. So again, more data and more kind of models are needed for this system because for thermal engineering, unless that lack of data can really, uh, in this particular case, it looks like would probably have you um, make a much larger, much larger surface area heat exchanger than you practically need, which would make your cost, your capital costs, look worse than they would actually would be. So again, more data and more need, models are definitely needed in this realm in order to figure this out. And just to contrast that with other ionic liquid systems, this being from the literature, not our own data, uh, but looking at the transition and thermal conductivity between the uh, pure ionic liquid and methanol in this case, and the pure ionic liquid in, in water. Again, with this particular system, do doing some type of simple uh, mixing rule uh, seems like it would be almost quantitatively uh, correct. And so you're looking at this, and again, usually density are argued for differences in uh, heat, heat thermal conductivity. Uh, but in this particular case, we think it might have to do more polarity and level of solvation 
of the ionic liquid with this uh, refrigerant gas, and, and that these higher dielectric constant solvents are able to probably completely solvate the ions. And so we get this more, more linear type effect, whereas R134A, as it goes into our system, probably mostly just fills up the free volume at first. Um, and so that's why we don't get much effect on the thermal conductivity. And again, I should point out with these systems, uh, liquid R134A and the ionic liquid have pretty similar densities of around 1, 1 1.2, 1.3 uh, grams per cc uh, in, their, in their mixture as well. However, their molar volume uh, does decrease because of the differences in molecular weights. So I want to just come back with a summary over all this work. So we've kind of woven together looking at phase behavior, phase equilibrium, a little bit of modeling, showing some potential applications, and then looking at some of the important properties in order to kind of understand how to use these and in, in various applications, namely the transport properties. So for the phase equilibria properties, uh, CO2 is almost always immiscible uh, with the ionic liquid, a type three type system. Whereas an R134A uh, does have more interesting phase, type five phase behavior. Um, both are relatively so, uh, soluble. We've at least shown thermodynamically that ionic liquids and these refrigerant gases might have a lot of potentials in a variety of different applications from engineering applications to just simple separating uh, hydrofluorocarbon gases. However, we, we see that we really need to know these transport properties in order to start engineering these and seeing that number of ionic liquids in industry jump from 50 to you know, 500 would be great. So uh, that's, that's the ult ultimate goal. We see that the dissolved gases really improve the mass and momentum transport properties. So the viscosity goes down, dif diffusivity goes up. With thermal conductivity, it's a little different. It seems that it has a modest decrease in the thermal conductivity um, until you get to very high compositions where it decreases much more rapidly. So at least for this model ionic liquid of HMMTF2N in the R134A, the tetrafluoroethane, uh, we have really starting to get now a really complete package of thermodynamic properties, at least phase equilibrium properties, and transport properties that we can do a lot mo more about trying to figure out how does that uh, translate into the engineering of these particular fluids for a variety of applications. However, as you can see that there's some very unusual behavior also, we have the fact that there's just so many ionic liquids out there, we can't possibly test them all. And so we'd always like to try to be able to find out uh, more molecular type effects, structure property relationships, in that how do we start matching up some of these applications with the right ionic liquid without having to do all of these experiments, which you can see uh, at least uh, some of the things have shown today have stretched over a decade uh, to figure out. So again, we need more uh, molecular level understanding and a better idea of the, the kind of chemistry of these particular systems. I'd like to thank uh, several uh, past and current graduate students, uh, Wei Nazida and uh, Kareem, uh, who's done the uh, thermal conductivity uh, measurements. Uh, one of the particular studies with the prolidinium, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Anahita kalak uh for help. Uh, my collaborator, uh, Professor Mark Schifflet, and we did a project together with one of his graduates, uh, uh, Tuba. We've also uh, interacted and collaborated with researchers at the Idaho National Labs and Northeastern University. And I'd like to thank some of these various funding sources from National Science Foundation, the Center for Environmentally Beneficial Catalysis here at the University of Kansas. And like to thank you for your time and attention uh, throughout out this talk. In fino manchi, qua fridge e us alunos e professores da UFRJ, muito obrigado pela esta oportunidade a falar com vocês. Foi um prazer para mim e uma honra. Muito obrigado novamente. Thank you. <laughs> Very thank nice. You, professor. <laughs> so thank you very much for the presentation. We now open the floor to question. Anyone can open the microphone and ask or write down in the chat and we can read here. So who wants to be the first? Uh, 
I could ask a oh, question. Professor or... Hajjago Pao. Okay, if Professor Ray, let's uh, go on. He should yeah. open. Open. Well, I guess I should start my please. video. Be polite. Yeah. Nice. All right. So, uh, really interesting. Um, lots of different things I could ask questions about, but I, I had an idea that is first in my mind as a person who's very interested in being able to predict physical properties and things like this. I, I looked at uh, self-diffusivity data a few years back and, and it's interesting, the entire database of measured self-diffusivity coefficients at the time was 1500 points. So, uh, and it's, it's available in the paper that we published. I could be wrong, if there's more, let me know. <laughs> And, and one of the pioneers in this pulse gradient method is uh, Ernst von Mierwald, who was a professor at the University of Akron. So he and I have talked about this and, and we, just, we just never got around to it. So I was wondering if, if maybe, just put it out there, maybe you could get around to it. Maybe it's purely academic. So it, maybe it's just an undergraduate project or something like that. So, so the issue is hydrogen bonding and the role that has one, one uh, Diff, self diffusivity and and so there's there's like five compounds that hydrogen bond that have been measured and, and not very well so um, the question is how can we see how hydrogen bonding impacts the self diffusivity uh, in a sequence of um, carboxylic acids so Basically, what Ernst said the problem was to, to see the impact of hydrogen bonding is the lifetime of a hydrogen bond is much shorter than the uh, measurement time of a pulse gradient method measurement. So, but if you were using this sequence of carboxylic acids, my hypothesis is, is you get to a, a long enough carboxylic acid, um, they would tend to stay bound because they're, those hydrogen bonding entities are more and more surrounded by uh, nonpolar environment. So, so they just can't get away from each other. So what, we, what you would see is going from acetic acid to maybe decanoic acid, somewhere in that spectrum, you would see a transition where the diffusivity looks like, goes by the molecular weight of the monomer. And then some point it goes by the molecular weight of the, the dimer. And, and could we see, and maybe somewhere along the way, actually be able to resolve two separate peaks for the self-diffusivity of the monomer and the dimer? It is a stupid academic idea, but if you ever have, some, have, 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 have a free student, some free time, I, I think the <laughs> measurements would be easy, would be relatively easy. No, thank you, Richard. That's a, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, you know, part of some of the problem it depends on what uh, proton that we can actually look at in the NMR uh, spectrum. Not all of them give the same uh, good results. And sometimes I think in your scenario with carboxylic acids, uh, I'd, I'd have to hope for that uh, some of the protons that we can track uh, would be uh, readily visible uh, in there and ones that we could potentially differentiate between, like you say, like, like a particular dimer or, you know, depending on the solvents, you know, if it's just a, uh, a monomer, if we have enough, uh, enough spectra that one, we can differentiate between those two and then two, be able to resolve them with time, uh, you know, under the pulse sequence, um, because sometimes with acidic protons, you know, they're, they're so fast on and off uh, that sometimes it's a little hard to track them um, in some of these uh, different spectra, but uh, um, I'll talk to you sometime or whatever uh, about okay, some of the I'm ideas. Okay, I'm always available. <laughs> yeah. No, but thank you. Thank you. Haja has a uh, question. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your talk, uh, Professor Aaron. I have two. One is uh, your opinion. You talked about the how the efficiency conceptually is greater in gas absorption, power generation. Gas absorption is coupled with turbine. So how do you compare it to an ideal Carnot efficiency? So you said it's 90, say 100 degrees and 40 degrees. And Carnot efficiency will be 40%. Do you get more yes. than 40%? 
So uh, what you're actually seeing here with those percentages are actually the differences in their Carnot efficiency between OR, the organic Rankine cycle and this new cycle. And, and you're right, if you look at Carnot efficiency, uh, you know, we're probably only talking on the order of 10%. Um, you know, so this is, uh, you know, a system and a technology that it most certainly isn't getting close to the efficiency of a, of a true Carnot cycle. Uh, but again, it's, it has uh, organic Rankine cycle has its niche applications for power development. It depends on what kind of heat you have available and what your kind of power needs. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, it's, you know, it's still very small compared to the Carnot cycle. So there's no way of uh, having, a, say, like family reaction, say fuel cell. You can have a temperature like uh, adiabatic combustion temperature, some hypothetical temperature like that. You yeah. explain a higher efficiency. Right. How do you see that in absorption cycles? Absorption also, you can think like a first order pseudo reaction rate, right? Absorption, desorption. Yeah. We, we haven't really looked at those mass transfer properties. Uh, again, when we did this modeling, it was purely thermodynamic, but you bring up a good point about, you know, uh, de desorption and the mass transfer needed and, you know, what are going to be your, you know, uh, sizes and height of transfer units or whatever that would have to occur in these absorbers and desorbers. But at least now that we have some of these diffusivities measured and some of these other transport properties, we might be able to uh, get into that. I would say, you know, what the key for this technology of why we think it's better than the ORC is that when you don't have to worry about the pressure that comes out of your turbine like you do for the ORC, for the ORC, you have to set that pressure that comes out above the con condensation uh, pressure in the condenser. And then you have to add a subcool here to protect your equipment. We think one of the reasons why we get uh, much better efficiencies is that we're not limited by that anymore. So when we engineer these, we don't have to worry about subcool conditions or whatever uh, in our absorber, et cetera. We know that we don't have to worry about danger to the pump. Um, if this is starting up or shutting down, it will just be a little bit leaner solution going up than we want and we won't get our full power efficiency, but eventually that will ca catch up. And so that's what we think is, you know, p potentially one of the benefits of, uh, you know, this particular technology. I, I'm really uh, thrilled with your idea of measuring all transport coefficients, especially viscosity and high pressure with Cambridge. You know, dissolved gases and liquids when the oscillating piston moves between the magnets, you know, there is many times a bubble generation, the bubble, how do you get rid of it? Or it may exhibit a non-Newtonian behavior. We measure hundreds of times to get some positives, especially temperature control. <laughs> no, all very good questions. And so, yes, we have to make sure that there's no bubbles in there. And actually the device has a uh, feature where it can rapidly uh, make the piston go up and down to dislodge any bubbles, but we, we have a flow system and so and it's pointed up. So we, we're, we have to make sure that we have enough of our fresh liquid from the equilibrium chamber that uh, pushes all the air bubbles out uh, in order to prevent that. Now you might think, well, what about cavitation? Well, that cycle for the piston is on the order of, uh, you know, seconds to tens of seconds. And so if there's no real cavitation worries uh, in, that, in that particular fluid. Um, but yeah, very good question. How about the angle of the thing you mentioned? You use 45 degrees or leave yes. horizontal or vertical? Yes, uh, the manufacturer recommends 45 degrees. Exactly. They actually have some new versions that are completely horizontal that they say can simultaneously measure a dynamic viscosity and kinematic viscosity. Exactly. Um, we haven't seen that yet, but we just have the version where they recommend 45 degree angle, um, except for gases when it should be 90. And do you control the temperature with a bath, liquid bath? So uh, or do you use the air? So we have a uh, environmental chamber that's air, uh, con convection air uh, type system. It's got a, a two stage uh, cooler that can go down to minus 40. And because of the size of the metal uh, in, uh, pieces involved in here, uh, we get pretty good temperature uh, stability uh, over time. So that is when I saw your figure, I was wondering why didn't you change it to a liquid bath? Uh, you know, this is, uh... So uh, part, of, part of the reason was that uh, we were doing uh, experiments with the Comores company that wanted to understand some of the refrigerants and lubricants and things like that. 
down to minus 25, minus 40 degrees Celsius. So we ended up putting it into that type of chamber. Um, you're right, uh, it would be a little bit quicker um, and a little bit more stable. But again, because the bodies of the metal are so large, uh, we get a lot of kind of thermal momentum once we get up to temperature. Okay, uh, along the same questions, do you worry about the dead volume? There's a small amount of dead volume between the valves and the oscillating cylinder chamber. This can be a problem, especially in dissolved gas liquid mixtures. How do you worry about this dead volume? So again, what we do is we flow it. And so what we're doing is we're trying to flush out every single thing with fresh sample uh, from the equilibrium chamber. Uh, but then what we, actually what we do, we don't measure it under flow. We stop everything from flowing. And then we turn on that oscillating piston uh, viscometer. Um, and we know it right away if there's a bubble in there, uh, you know. Yeah, that's really easy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's and um, you know, that, that system we've actually used to, we did some studies in high pressure biodiesel uh, viscosity. And, you know, some of the things you have to worry about when you start pressurizing, you know, alkane mixtures and esters and things like that is actually freezing in the lines. And so we know from our viscosity measurements when we're getting very cl close to a uh, cloud point, Basically, this was a doubt. And one more final question about viscosity is, did you worry about non-Newtonian behavior, especially when you go down temperatures? Maybe viscosity may not be a measure. Right, so. Uh-oh. Yuri? Oi. Eu acho que ele congelou, né? Yeah, we're having some technical difficulties. Yes. We have a problem. O sensor era um escuto. No primeiro mundo também tem problema, Fred. Yes. <laughs> ok. Ok. Uh. So... Um, I think he's going to return. Probably. Okay. Hey, can communicate with him? Maybe he doesn't perceive it, no? Yuri. Ah. Maybe he doesn't perceive it. Maybe. Someone has to get in contact with him. Get in contact with him. No, I I don't have uh, uh, WhatsApp. Marlon, tá aí? Marlon? No? Oi, oi. Você consegue mandar um e-mail para ele rapidinho? Ok, um segundo. Ah, ele já mandou mensagem. É. Yeah. Uh -huh. My laptop froze. I'm trying to join from my computer office. Ok. As curto, ok. Great. You hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, apologize. For some reason, my laptop froze up. Uh, so I'm joining from my uh, other computer real quick. Um, I don't have a uh, camera on that, so I apologize. But I can okay. still, I answer questions and <laughs> advance slides, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So, Raja. Professor Raja. Uh, uh, there's no uh, problem. I was just wondering about the non-Newtonian behavior. Do these liquids behave non-Newtonian way at lower temperatures? especially when you're talking about minus 25, minus 20 degrees. So, so far with ionic liquid systems, uh, it's mostly been uh, Newtonian behavior. Uh, we have had some other systems where we had, uh, say, cellulose dissolved in ionic liquids, and those definitely do not have uh, Newtonian behavior. Those are non-Newtonian uh, type systems. But uh, 
Our viscometer, it does have a little bit of flexibility as far as the period of oscillation, but it's mostly for Newtonian uh, type systems. And on the last question that I want to ask you is this, uh, uh, which other professor uh, raised about hydrogen bonding between ionic liquids and dissolved gases. Do you think that uh, this may be you vary with the composition or it has to be considered like a chemical reaction, like for example, you pointed out a dimerization. So if you yeah. use a dimer, dimer and I mean, is there kinetics involved in it? How will it affect your thermodynamic efficiency of your cycles you are visualizing? You may have to design a different type of Carnot cycle perhaps. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, you know, we just really looked at these uh, type of uh, uh, HFC uh, ionic liquid type system, which, which, you know, the HFC, it does have some small hydrogen bonding uh, going on there. But the stronger that is, you know, uh, what's, what's probably going to occur is that, you know, in some ways, hydrogen bonding will be great in this absorber. We're, a, we're able to absorb at a given pressure and temperature, you know, a lot more of the gas. But then we need something that, uh, you know, rapidly decreases its hydrogen bonding with uh, temperature. Of course, it's always going to go down, but something rapid enough that, to go from something that's around 40 C to something that's 100 C, because in this desorber part, we want to be able to liberate that uh, high pressure, high temperature gas as easily as possible. And if there's a lot of hydrogen bonding still residual in those interactions, it's going to be much less efficient in here. So it's going to be somewhat of a trade-off between better performance in the absorber, but we might need more heat in the desorber in order to make this particular cycle or the refrigerant re refrigeration cycle work better. The, the problem is uh, how do you take into account the entropy of mixing? Actually, the entropy may be decreasing in some of these cases, and it may be absorbing more heat from the ambient and making their efficiency even better, like in biological systems. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, we don't explicitly uh, try to figure things out or you know look do the analysis in terms of uh, entropies of mixing and things like that. But it but but it raises a good point about you know how to design some of these particular systems. Okay, thank you very much. This is basically it. No, very you, interesting talk, and I really find very interesting. You are trying to measure diffusivity with, and. Uh, Thermoconductivity as well as uh, the viscosities. Thank yeah, I'm you. trying to do too much, probably, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very nice. I think it's time to to finish. No, uh, Yuri. I think our time yeah, is. I, I guess. So let us thank again, Professor Aaron, for the great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.